Does it really matter? Rick and I were talking the other day, and that's a question that comes up a lot. People say, does it really matter? What we believe, what you believe about the Father and His Son, what you believe about what happens when we die, what you believe about the paradise earth that will be restored, what you believe about the second coming of Jesus. Is it literal? Is it not? Is it a presence or is it a literal coming? Does it really matter? What about our diet, the things that we eat? Does it really matter? The music, the entertainment. I get a little personal sometimes when I talk about these things because it affects me personally. And when I ask about music and entertainment and movies that we watch, we're delving into our personal lives, not just what people see, because a lot of us do things behind closed doors at home that nobody sees. Or do they? There is someone who sees it. So does it really matter? What about the Sabbath day? Does it really matter what day of the week that I decide to rest? Christianity, most of them would say these things don't really matter. In the majority of Christianity, that's what they would say. But I guess the question I want to ask is, does it really matter to you as an individual? Does it really matter as far as your relationship with God? Does it really matter regarding your salvation, these things that we're talking about? What about the holidays? I talk to people every day, especially this time of year, that are really wrapped up in the things that are going on in the world today. And I find that the holidays focus for most people is not on the, the birth of Jesus Christ, as most people, most Christians would say that's what they're celebrating. It's on, well, I have to get this for Uncle Joe. And, you know, if he gets me something and I don't buy something back, what, what, what's he going to think of me? And I've got to get to the store because, I, I, you know, I, I've got to get there because if I don't, they're closed tomorrow and I've got to have a gift for somebody. And then people teach their kids about this old man coming down the chimney. Is that truth? Or is it a lie? And does it really matter if I teach those things to my kids? Does it really matter about the origins of any particular holiday or anything that we do, anything that we're involved in? Well, what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to show you things that both secular and religious organizations have to say about holidays in general, not just one in particular. Uh, we're going, going to look at a few particularly but we're first going to look at the Christmas holiday since we, it just passed us. It's just there. I still walk around. I see lots. When I walk through my neighborhood, when I take my walk every day, I see if it's late at night or in the evening. I see all these lights. I see sleighs on roofs and snowmen wearing red hats and all these different things. And what I'd like to do is as we look through these things and we examine what authorities have to say about these things, I want you to ask yourself, does it really matter? Take a look at this reference here. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume 2, 1973, a secular authority. It says, in the Roman world, the Saturnalia was a time of merrymaking and exchanging of gifts. December 25th was also regarded as the birth date of the Iranian mystery god, Mithra, the son of righteousness. On the Roman New Year, houses were decorated with greenery and lights and gifts were given to children. To those observances were added the German Celtic Yule Rites, food and fellowship, uh, food and good fellowship, the Yule log and Yule cakes, greenery and fir trees, gifts and greetings, all commemorated different aspects of this festive season. Fires and lights, symbols of warmth and lasting life, have always been associated with the Winter Festival, both pagan and Christian.
both pagan and Christian? Should Christianity have anything to do with paganism? Should they even be related? Are they any way related? Does it really matter? Let's look at another reference. This is Reader's Digest. Strange Stories, Amazing Facts, pages 283 through 285. It says, Christmas and Easter, though the greatest festivals in the Christian calendar, are celebrated with customs that originated in superstition and heathen rites hundreds of years before Christ was born. Even the dates owe more to pagan practices than to the birth and resurrection of Jesus. It was not until the 4th century that December 25th was fixed arbitrarily as the anniversary of the nativity because the pagan festivals from which so many Christian customs spring were held around that time. I find it very interesting that the 4th century, so many things come from the 4th century. Many of the questions that I asked right at the outset about the things that we believe were changed in the 4th century in Christianity or tried to change. There was a massive influence that tried to change the truth into something that wasn't truth. And that's what we're seeing here in this reference. This reference continues, though. Take a look. Next page, it says, although Christianity was, has swept the world in a relatively short time, the missionaries faced an uphill task. The pagans were reluctant to give up their false gods and ancient practices. So the missionaries, unable to convert them easily to an entirely new code of worship, did the next best thing. The next best thing, what's that? Well, according to this, it says, they took the pagan festivals as they were and gradually grafted them, grafted the observances of the new faith onto these festivals and the rites and customs surrounding them. December 25th was not called Christmas until the 9th century. Until then, it had been the midwinter feast, a combination of the Norse Yule Festival and the Roman Saturnalia, both of which took place in late December. So since pagans would, would not change their beliefs, the Christians decided to change theirs. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that thinking. Why is it that Christians always seem to compromise, but these pagans that have false beliefs are locked on to their false ways and their false gods? Why is that the case? It seems like they won't budge. Some do. Some want to learn and want to know. And when they hear these things, they make sense. But do we put faith in what God's word says? That's what it boils down to. And the pagans will remain committed to their gods. But it seems like the Christians always compromise looking back in history. It seems that's the case. There are some that remain steadfast. But the vast majority of Christians have faltered or compromised their beliefs for the sake of keeping peace. For the sake of, well, I don't want to cause any trouble. And it's just going to cause me more trouble than I'm used to. Does it really matter? Next, look at this reference. The Encyclopedia Americana, 1944 edition. Christmas, according to many authorities, was not celebrated in the first centuries of the Christian church. In the 5th century, the Catholic Church ordered it to be celebrated forever on the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of Sol Invictus, as no certain knowledge of the day of Christ's birth existed. Well, you know what? The day of Christ's birth still doesn't exist. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We can get an approximate time of Christ's birth if we study the Bible, but it doesn't give us a specific day. And the approximate time is not December 25th, by the way. It's not even in December. It's likely in September or October, somewhere in that range. The one day that is told in the Bible, a specific date, is the date of Christ's death. And we know the date of his resurrection. We know those things. These were the things that Christ put importance on because those are the things that are important to us as Christians. Not the day that he was born on the earth, 
but the day that he fulfilled the obligation that he had and the duty that he took upon himself that his father asked him to do that he would buy us back. That was important. That's marked. That's in scripture. And we're told to commemorate that. To do those things. But I want you to notice that the references that we've looked at so far, none of these have come from the Bible. These are from people in general. The secular authorities, we could say. People who are learned, who are educated, who have put these things down. And even the Catholic Church in this last Encyclopedia Americana reference that we looked at, they say that this is why December 25th has been chosen. Chosen. Sol Invictus. Well, let's take a look a little further. The Catholic Encyclopedia, now we're going to look at what a religious encyclopedia has to say, 1911 edition. Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. The first evidence of the feast is from Egypt. Pagan customs centering around the January calends gravitated to Christmas. Does it really matter? Another highly recognized day in America, not just Christmas, we mentioned Easter, but another highly recognized day in America is Valentine's Day. And other countries recognize this too. That's the next major holiday, we would say. It's February 14th. It seems like there's always something just around the corner. There's always something to pull us back into some form of false worship or paganism. So what are the origins of Valentine's Day? And does it really matter? I want you to keep asking yourself that question. Does it really matter? This is from NPR.com, National Public Radio. It says the holiday has, this is Valentine's Day, the holiday has origins in the Roman festival of Lupercalia held in mid-February. At the end of the fifth century, Pope uh, Galatius the first replaced Lupercalia with St. Valentine's Day. It came to be celebrated as a day of romance from about the 14th century. You might say, Lupercalia, what, what is Lupercalia? Well, this next slide shows a picture of, this is basically Pan standing up. Uh, the word panic comes from this Greek mythological god named Pan. And have you ever heard of the Pan flute? The pan flute, it's, it's these, all these little uh, flutes lined up and you play it. And uh, he would play the pan flute and through his playing of the flute, it would cause some kind of an erotic control to come over this other person. And who you see here in this picture is Pan and Faunus. And what Lupercalia would do in the Feast of Lupercalia is they would actually have these women running around and they would strike them with whips. And this was an actual festival that they would have. And they felt that if they could hit the woman with the whip, it would not only make them more fertile, but it would make them their property. And it goes a lot deeper. It's, it's a horrible festival. It's a filthy thing. It's, it has nothing to do with the relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. It's an, immor it's an immoral thing that, that should never even be considered. So this pan and faunus that you see in this picture when we look at this, does it really matter that this is where Valentine's Day came from? You know, the church adopted this ancient festival. When I say the church, I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. Uh, the Catholic Church adopted it, and guess what? Protestants who come out of Catholicism, a lot of those things came with them. But there was a, there was a group of people who didn't do these things. Have you ever heard of the Puritans? You know, the Puritans kept their worship as pure as they possibly knew because they were following the word of God and they rid themselves of a lot of these things, of all the holidays and the things that they knew weren't rooted in Bible truth. Praise God for groups like that that want to follow the word of God no matter what. So what had happened was the church, the Catholic church and some Protestant churches, I'd say the majority, have adopted this ancient festival unknowing, some of them, that they're worshiping a false god. Now, when, when this was originally done, they knew it. They were trying to offset it, as we read. They were trying to adopt these things to make it comfortable. And this way, maybe we can get some pagans to come in here if we teach some pagan doctrines. You know, we can make them feel needed and wanted and, and comfortable. 
We don't want to have to tell them what they need to hear. We want to tell them what they want to hear. Is that the attitude we should have? Does it really matter? Does God really care about the customs that were a part of something? Does he care about the customs that are used to worship and honor him? Or whether or not we celebrate the Valentine's holiday? God warned Israel of this. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. Beginning in verse 29, it says, When Jehovah your God shall cut off the nations before you, where you go to possess them, and you take their place and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you do not become snared by following them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not ask about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? That I too may do likewise. You shall not do so to Jehovah your God, for every abomination to Jehovah, which he hates, they have done to their gods. Now when you look at this text, I want you to notice that the issue in this passage is not the worship of other gods. That's not what he's addressing. He's not addressing the fact that they're worshiping other gods. That is a problem, let me say that, worshiping other gods. But this passage specifically is focusing on and warning us not to adopt the customs used to worship and honor other gods. That's what this text is saying. In order to serve and worship the true God, I want you to notice what Paul says in Corinthians. What then do I say? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What then do I say? That the idol is anything or that an idolatrous sacrifice is anything? But I say that the things which the nations sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not desire that you should have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of demons. So we really should be thinking about these things. If God says he doesn't want them to develop the customs of what they're doing, what does that mean? If I'm keeping Christmas or Valentine's Day, what am I adopting? Am I adopting the customs according to the things in secular history that we read? When I bring those traditions into my worship, into my life, into my home, even behind the doors, it's your business. It's none of my business. But does it really matter? Here's a few more facts about the origins of Valentine's Day. Here's a closer picture. This is a sculpture of Pan. And I want you to notice he's holding the Pan flute there. And then, of course, we have this picture of Aphrodite and Pan next to her. And Eros. Eros. Have you ever heard that? You know, the Greek word, one of the Greek words for love is eros. Remember, one of the Greek words for love is agape, self-sacrificing love. Phileo, which is a brotherly love. You have storge, which is a principled love. And you have eros, which is an erotic type of love. And I always like to say this, the beautiful thing about the relationship between a man and his wife is they can experience all of those types of love with that person. It's a wonderful thing. But the problem with this and this false god and the way this looks is that this is a perverted type of love. I want you to, to take a look here. Here we have Eros or Cupid, as a lot of people would call him, the little winged cherub there. They make him look like a... what. Uh, Mythology has made angels look like these little cute, innocent things with wings. And in Roman mythology, Cupid is the god of desire. And he's the god of affection and the god of erotic love. That's why he has the name either Eros or Cupid. The, the problem is with Cupid or Eros is this erotic love is a, it's not a love between a man and his wife. It's that way with anyone. And that's what they were celebrating. Today, 
Cupid is many times shown with shooting an arrow. You ever see that? Letting the arrow go, and it goes into the little heart. And it's supposed to inspire romantic love. I want you to notice this is the bottom part of this image. You notice that Pan is not just a man, it's also a goat. You see the feet there and the legs? And this is called the God of Love. Now, the, the, the perverted thing about this, what's really sick, is that this er erotic type of love that they're talking about is actually with not just a human being, but also with animals. And this is a perversion. In fact, Leviticus 18, if you look at what it says here, God says in the Old Testament, you shall not lie with a male as, a, as with a woman. So it's saying that there shall not be homosexuality. It is an abomination. Nor shall you mate with any animal to defile, your, defile yourself with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. And this is what the origins of Valentine's Day do. But does it really matter? Pan worship. It's actually related to bestiality. So here's some, some statistics about Valentine's Day. I find this interesting. Look at the money that's spent. And the numbers here are staggering. Average annual Valentine's Day spending is $18 billion, $500 million dollars on average. On average. There's 180 million Valentine's Day. This is just in America, by the way. <laughs> this is just in the United States. Valentine's Day cards exchanged annually, 180 million. Roses produced for Valentine's Day, 224 million. This is commercial, isn't it? It's about the, the money in many ways. The average uh, consumer spends $130 on Valentine's Day, whether it's taking somebody out to eat or buying them chocolates or flowers. This is the average. Some are going to be higher, some lower. Uh, consumers who celebrate Valentine's Day, over 60%, 61.8%. And I would venture to say that the majority of these people, because this is in the United States, are called Christian. It's unfortunate. And the percent of women who would end their relationship if they didn't get something for Valentine's Day is over half of them. What is the relationship built on? It's not built on true love. Well, if I don't get chocolates or I don't get candy, I'm out of here. You don't give me a card or take me to dinner on that day. Wow, that is, that, that's so worldly. That's so ungodlike. Just a couple of more. I like this particular one. 58 million pounds of chocolate purchased for Valentine's Day during the week. And heart-shaped boxes of chocolate purchased for Valentine's Day. 36 million heart-shaped boxes. So somebody's capitalizing on this. So even companies that are known as Christian companies, there are companies that, you know, that are known for being Christian companies. We've talked about this in the past, like a company like Chick-fil-A. They close on Sunday because they firmly believe, the owners believe, that that is the Sabbath day. And, and they, you know, they're doing the right thing. It just happens to be the wrong day. So, you know, I've often wondered, I think I've said this, maybe we should try to reach those people. I, I think that would be a worthy goal to try to reach them and witness to them. How much more would their business be blessed if they did it on the right day? I know that for a fact. But there are Christian companies, companies that are owned by Christians that actually capitalize on this pagan celebration. You may recognize this company. Little Debbie, it's a Christian-owned company. But they put this stuff out there about Valentine's Day. What are they promoting? False worship. Paganism. All for the sake of the dollar or for the sake of, well, we want to fit in. We can capitalize on that. Does it really matter? 
Well, is, is Easter taught in the Bible? There are people that will say, yes, Easter is taught in the Bible. I've, I've had that come up before. And, but let me explain. We're going to look at a text right now where the, the word Easter is used. Okay, The word Easter is found in the Bible, in the King James Bible. But I want you to know that when, when Herod wanted to persecute Christians, he actually had killed James, the brother of John, and then he reaches out to Peter. He has Peter arrested. And here's what happens in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. This is from the King James Version. It says, And when he had apprehended, that's when Herod had apprehended Peter, he, Herod, put him in prison, put Peter in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So we've talked about Christmas, we've talked about Valentine's Day, now we've moved on to the next holiday, which is Easter. And we see that the word Easter is found here in, in the King James Bible. But the truth be known, this is unfortunately a result of poor translation. Now we talked last week about a verse that had been added. Now we're talking about a word that we were looking at. And, well, what do I do now? How do I know this is right or wrong? You see, the vast majority of Bible translations, if we look at it in, in my New King James and in the NIV Bible and, and many, many others, this Greek word pasha, which is Passover, is translated as Passover. But unfortunately, in the King James, they, in this one place, they translated that word as Easter. So we see some things that can happen. Now, I want you to notice what this is not... Uh, this is common knowledge to those who study these things. In the Westminster Dictionary, here's what it says about this. Uh, Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, page 145, it says, Easter is the spring festival in honor of the Teutonic goddess of light and spring, known in Anglo-Saxon as Easter. As early as the 8th century, the name was transferred by the Anglo-Saxons to the Christian festival designed to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. In the AV, or Authorized Version, which is the King James Version, it occurs once, and it says in Acts 12, 4. We just looked at it. It says, but is a mistranslation. That's what it says. Notice what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. 1909 edition, volume 5, page 227. A great many pagan customs celebrating the return of spring gravitated to Easter. The egg is the emblem of the germinating life of early spring. The rabbit is a pagan symbol and has always been an emblem of fertility. So we see the Westminster Dictionary tells us that word was added. We see the origins of these things. The Catholic Church is recognizing the origin, the, the fertility. Let's take a look again. Encyclopedia Americana, 1956 edition, volume 9, page 506. It says, according to the Venerable Bede, English historian of the early 8th century, the word Easter is derived from the Norse Ostara or Eustre, meaning the festival of spring at the vernal equinox, March 21st, when nature is in resurrection after winter. Hence the rabbits, noted for their fecundity, and the eggs, colored like the rays of the returning sun, and the northern lights or aurora borealis. Pure paganism. Easter. Nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to celebrate the birth of Christ. But we are instructed to commemorate the death of Christ. Why do we allow these things to creep in? With most of us here, I would venture to say that the vast majority of Christians have grown up accepting this because this is what they've been taught, this is what the churches teach, this is the background that they had. We're a product of our environment. We do it because, hey, my family does it. It looks right. It sounds good. We're honoring Christ. We're doing these things. But once it's pointed out to us, what do we do with that? What do we do with that information? That's my question. Does it really matter? Take a look at this. Funk and Wagnall's Standard Dictionary of Folklore, Mythology, and Legend, 1949 edition, volume 1, page 335. Children roll posh eggs in England. Everywhere they hunt the many colored Easter eggs brought by the Easter rabbit. Do rabbits lay eggs? 
I don't think so. This is not mere child's play, but the vestige of a fertility rite, the eggs and the rabbit both symbolizing fertility. Furthermore, the rabbit was the escort of the Germanic goddess, Ostara, who gave the name to the festival by way of the German Ostern. So again, nowhere in the Bible does it indicate that early Christians observed a, a, a weekly Sunday, like Christians do today, or any kind of annual Easter celebration, which people do today. Nowhere did they commemorate the resurrection of Christ or the birth of Christ in early Christianity. And this is known by secular and religious authorities. Does it really matter? with just a little bit of research that we've done right here. Just this little bit, just these few slides. There haven't been many. But with a little research, we've seen that the Christian religious authorities and the secular authorities openly admit that almost everything associated with Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day are rooted in pure paganism. If it's pure, can we call it pure paganism? Do we need to even talk about Halloween? No, I don't think we do. We know what that is. And unfortunately, there are churches in the local area that are well-meaning when they do it. They're well-meaning, I believe. But they have, instead of trick-or-treat, they have trunk-or-treat, where they load up the, the trunks with candy and goods, and they dress up, and they come, and they... Does it really matter? Do we need to do that to offset or should we just keep away from anything that looks like something that the world is doing? Shouldn't we be pure? Shouldn't we distance ourselves from that? You know, when I think about these things, it's unbelievable. An another holiday that you may, that I know you're aware of, but I don't know if you know the truth about it, is St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day. Who was St. Patrick? Who was St. Patrick? Well, his real name was Maywin Sukkot. Wasn't St. Patrick at all. And the interesting thing about this man is the Catholic Church, and they admit this, hijacked this godly man, almost a Puritan of some type. He, he believed in pure worship, and they hijacked him. And they have taught Christians and most of Christianity into believing that St. Patrick used the three-leaf clover to go to places to teach the Trinity to people. I sat in a church and heard a lady tell a children's story where she picked up, had a three-leaf clover, and she said, each one of these leaves, this represents God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and St. Patrick went and he taught people the Trinity. You remember that? If I could hardly contain myself as I sat there and listened to that. And this is what people believe about St. Patrick. But the truth is, Patrick, the man that we know as St. Patrick, Maywin Sukkot, he rejected everything that Rome stood for. Did you know that? Everything. He rejected infant baptism. He rejected the immortality of the soul. He actually believed and kept the seventh-day Sabbath. He rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. He rejected eternal hellfire. He kept the biblical diet. There were no unclean meats in his diet. This is historical facts. And contrary to what the Catholic Church has propagated about him, he rejected a triunity of deity, a trinity. But this is what they have done. They've hijacked this godly man that taught truth and they turned it into something else. Does it really matter? I wouldn't want people saying that about me. You know, a hundred years from now, if this world's still going, there might be somebody saying, that Mark Martin, let me tell you, he used to preach the trinity every, every Sunday. You, you don't know. They could, <laughs> Rick's laughing. They could do that. 
So we need to do our study. We need to check these things. Don't believe it because somebody said it. Don't believe it because I say it. I want you to notice Hosea chapter 4. I've got it here on the PowerPoint, verse 6. Jehovah says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. I also will forget your children. So it's very important that we know and understand and that we try to get that knowledge. As we talked about in Sabbath school today, digging for it as for silver. That was the text you were talking about, searching for it. It's an effort. It's work. And I'll, I'll be honest, boy, I, I used to hate to read and I used to hate to study. But the more I study my Bible, the more I, I have a hunger for it. I, I, I can't wait sometimes to sit down. You know, when the Sabbath hours begin, it is such a joy to be able to just, you know, my, my phone blows up a little because I, I, I tend to send out a happy Sabbath message and a lot of people text me, which I love those texts. But after that calms down and it's so quiet, I just, I love it. And I get to open my Bible and concentrate on things and just the world is tuned out. It's a marvelous time. Studying God's Word. It, it's almost like if you've ever, if you, if, I don't I think Ed, didn't you used to run, Ed? You were a runner at one time. And what happens is after, you, you know, when you first start, it's, it's almost probably grueling. You know, many, many years ago, 30 years ago or better, I would run too. And now I walk every day and I walk pretty hard. And if I miss a day, I don't feel quite right. I can tell. And I have that, but at first it was kind of brutal. You know, I'd hit these big hills and it was just, it was a lot of work. And now I find, wow, I'm over that hill and I didn't realize I'm not, I don't feel like I have to stop halfway up the hill. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. Bible study is the same way. We think clearer when we exercise. We think clearer when we read God's Word. It's an exercise. It really is. It really is. I'd like you to open your Bibles to our scripture reading for the, for the day. Just a couple more things to share with you. Our scripture reading for the day is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Oops, I'm in 1 Corinthians. I knew that didn't look right. And this is Paul speaking. And he asks the question, he says here, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? So I guess I could ask, does it really matter? Paul is saying it does matter. It does matter. The next verse. And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? It doesn't mean that we can't go and witness to people. That we can't have interactions with them. But we have to be careful not to adopt the traits of the world. Don't be yoked together with them. Next, verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. I'm going to stop there for a moment. So I was talking about this Mayuan Sukkot who the Catholic Church hijacked and called St. Patrick and talked about the things that he believed. These are things that Prophecies of Hope teaches because they come from the Bible. And one of the things that he did was he... He valued the temple because it says which temple you are, right? For you are the temple of the living God. So does, does it really matter what I eat? It does. And then it goes on in verse 16. As God said, and this is from Leviticus, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Do you want God to dwell in you? Yeah. Therefore, verse 17, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. It doesn't say don't eat what is unclean. It says don't touch it. 
If it's in my mouth, I'm touching it. I might say, well, I'm using a fork. I'm not really touching it. Don't even touch it. Verse 18. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says, and mine, it's all capitalized because it's quoting from 2 Samuel, says Jehovah Almighty. So, does it really matter? Does it really matter? Here's a text on the PowerPoint, John 4, 23. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to work, worship him. So if we're going to worship our God in spirit and truth, wouldn't you agree that we should be careful and examine the things that we believe and what their origins are and examine the things that we've been taught and make sure that they're in line with what his word the Bible says? Shouldn't we be willing to get anything out of our lives that might prevent me from pure worship? That might prevent me from having a relationship with him? That might prevent me from allowing him to come into the temple which he wants to dwell? You know, I ask the question again, does it really matter? Um, just a text. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't have this in the PowerPoint. I was looking to see. I want you to turn very briefly. This is a closing text. To Ex Exodus chapter 32. It just, this is a powerful text. Exodus 32. And here Moses is up on Mount Sinai. I wasn't planning on doing this. But I have to share this. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And Aaron and the camp are all down here. And remember, Aaron is the priest. And if you remember, I'm just going to set this up for you a little bit. What he does is he, he asks everybody, they had just come out of Egypt, and he says, I want you to take all your gold and silver, all the gold earrings, all this jewelry, and we're going to melt it down, and we're going to make something and dedicate it to Jehovah God. So they did. They gave him all their jewelry, and he puts it in this kiln, and he melts it down, and he crafts this golden calf and puts it up on an altar. And they're worshiping the true God, Jehovah. And they put this up there. Verse 3, Exodus 32, verse 3. So all the people broke off the gold earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5, so when they saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to, not to a false god, not to a pagan god, to Jehovah. He puts this idol up and says, tomorrow is a feast to Jehovah. Then they rose early in verse 6 on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up and play. And Jehovah said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And he goes on to explain what they've done. Here's the thing. Were they worshiping a false god? Had they built this gold calf to a false god? See, they didn't build it to a false god. But God rejected it because he says these things you shouldn't do. So when we bring these things from paganism into our lives and we represent them as, well, I'm just celebrating a harmless thing or celebrating the birth of Christ or celebrating the resurrection of Jesus or just celebrating the love for my wife or husband... What are we doing? We're doing this. God rejected it. He rejected it. As a result of this, 3,000 people died that day because they were actually putting this thing up, representing, thinking they were worshiping the true God when in essence they had put an idol up and 
That's how God received it. He said, you put that up there, you're not worshiping me. That's what he's saying. So does it really matter what I think about these days, what I do with those days, what I do at that time of year? What does it represent? Does it represent purity? Does it represent the true God? Does it represent everything that the Bible stands for? You know, I don't know if you, if you read this account through, it's, it's interesting that Aaron says, you know, I, I put the gold in and this calf popped out. He tried to make it look like it just sprang out of there the way it was, but it says just prior to that that he engraved it. He took time. You know, people take time to put up these things. The time that it takes some of my neighbors to put up their decorations, I'm thinking, where do you find the time? How do you have space for all that stuff? Where do you put it in your house? Because it's all over the place. And if we put that time and energy that we put into those things, into studying God's word, into propagating the true gospel to people, and getting out and sharing with the community, just think, I think Christ could have come by now if the work was done. If the work was done. But you'll notice if you read through that account, if you take time to do it, they actually ground that gold idol to powder. It's worthless worthless stuff. Does it really matter?